It is my pleasure to be here, and I am thankful for the invitation from the director and the faculty and from the elders of this congregation. I look out over those of you who are assembled today, and I see many people older than me that I have admired for a long time. I see others who are either my age or younger that I also admire for their work's sake, and I also see Ryan Curry's out there. So uh, <laughs> good to see you, Ryan. I wanted to get you back for what you told me earlier. Some of you have come to me and said that this hour, I'd better keep it interesting because you wouldn't need an Ambien. You'd just be going to sleep if I didn't. I said, you're ask and somebody else asked me if I had an Ambien. I said, you're asking me for the wrong drugs. I have a teenage daughter that started driving three weeks ago. I got your Valium in this pocket and your Xanax in this pocket. <laughs> Whatever you want along those lines, I can give you. We are... She did see a sign the other day at her school. She's just started Parkersburg South High School. One of her teachers had up what I thought was a pretty good sign, and I thought it was a compliment to our daughter that she would tell us about it. The sign said, are you tired of putting up with your stupid parents? It said, act now. Get a job, buy a house, and pay all the bills. Hurry while you still know everything. <laughs> Well, there might be something to know in everything that has something to do with pride and something to do with our lesson has something to do with idolatry. Now, how's that for a segue? Idolatry, of course, is, well, I didn't spend a lot of time in the manuscript defining it. I spent one sentence just because I think we're all pretty sure of what idolatry is. Putting anything in the place of the one God concerning our affections, our desires, our allegiances, and our actions. Anything that gets in the way of my relationship with God becomes my idol. Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 3 says that we have set up idols in our hearts, or they had set up idols in their hearts. Some of us do not have any sort of uh, image on a mantle or a place that we go or a jewelry piece that we wear, but we have things that we put before God. Of course, the scripture says that covetousness is idolatry. There was a preacher on television a couple nights ago. It's like many TV preachers. You like some of the things they say, and you might like their delivery, but you don't like all of what they say because most of them aren't preaching the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. And this fellow said something I'll just give you to consider. I'm not sure what I think about it. Well, yeah, I am a little bit. He said that uh, if God were to come to some idolatrous nation that had their idols on their mantles and in their temples, and God just with one fell swoop, wiped all of them off their shelves, we'd think, all right, God. And then we look at the stock market and we wonder what happened there. Now, do I think that God was directly behind that? I will never, ever know what God does in his providence and what God does. But i say this. It's a blow to a lot of people that were still good, that had some retirement savings that they've lost. But then maybe... Could you pray? Would it be right to pray that it wakes America up? Wow. Oprah gets on her television so show and says that she has a problem with God being a jealous God. She said she was raised in a Baptist church and everything was going along fine until one day she heard the preacher talk about how God was a jealous God. And that just sent her reeling. So what she's up to nowadays is setting up other gods in his place. My daughter asked, at a young, tender age, how come we're not supposed to be jealous, but God is jealous? Shut up, kid, or I'll turn this van around. <laughs> you know, what, do you, what do you do with a question like that? The best thing that I could come up with, maybe you could guide me better, is this. I'm not allowed to be jealous of any of you. Because in God's sight, we are all equal. There is no Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We all have different talents, and we're supposed to contribute those talents to the upbuilding of the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. But there is only one God. And anybody else is a pretender. If he weren't jealous, we ought to be disappointed in him. But he is jealous because he is the only one. Idolatry in any day and time needs to be exposed as the height of human arrogance. First, 
our text, Zephaniah chapter 2, starting at verse 8. Gene already dealt with how Israel, or Judah at this time, was dealing with enemies from the south, the southwest particularly, Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, the cities of the Philistines. Now then, to the east, we have Moab and Ammon. To the south, in verse 12, you'll have the Ethiopians. And to the north, in verses 13 and 14, you'll have Assyria. They were catching it from every side. First, understand that Moab and Ammon, the nations that descended, as mentioned earlier today, from the incestuous daughters of Lot and their relationship with him after they got him drunk, these nations were always very happy at anything bad that would happen to Israel or the southern kingdom, Judah. And God would not like it when people would be angry with his people. God would want to destroy his people sometimes. Well, I don't know if he'd ever want to, but he'd have to because of his justice. And when he would, there would be other nations that would mock them, that would want to bring them down, and that would just want to point a finger at them and ridicule them. God didn't put up with that either. Do you know that? Do you suppose that if America fell today, there would be nations all over the world, peoples rallying in the streets, jumping for joy, shooting their guns in the air? I don't, you know, I've lived a pretty naive little life, and I didn't realize till about seven years and a month ago how much people in this world hated us. But they do, and they want us down. The only reason I make that comparison is to bring the point home to us and not to suggest that we're God's people like Israel was. That's just not the case. When Judah was going to be punished, it would not circumvent God's anger that other nations would be happy, but he would sure carry out his wrath on those nations as well. Read in Ezekiel chapter 25 about the people of Ammon at the beginning. And here was the reason for their judgment. Because you said, aha, at my people. Aha. And it wasn't as if they had an idea. It's as if they were saying, I told you so. You people are getting yours. And because you looked, he says later of some people in Ezekiel 25, and then the destruction of the city of Tyre in Ezekiel 26, 27, and 28, as prophesied by that great prophet. A prophecy we all look to to show the particulars of how God fulfills his punishment. You know, many nations come up against them. God named the first king to come against them. Their rocks were thrown into the sea. You know why it was? Because they said, aha, when Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Because they said, look at you people. You thought you were something, and you got yours too. God says, you know, remember this. I may have destroyed them, but they were my people. And I don't want you mocking them. Look at verse 8 of Zephaniah 2. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be like Sodom. Well, that's not good company. And the people of Ammon like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. The residue of my people shall plunder them and the remnant of my people shall possess them. God wasn't going to have any more to do with Moab and Ammon because they thought that they'd gotten their justice and they'd had their just deserts when Israel would receive punishment from God. A little bit of history about Moab that you already know, so I'll just briefly call it to your attention. In Numbers chapter 22 through 25, there's a little incident, actually just through 24, there's a little incident about Balak, the king of Moab, being afraid of the amassing armies of the Israelites. And this was before, long before, of course, the time setting of Zephaniah. Just goes to show some of the history. Balak didn't know what to do about that, and he sure couldn't pray to the real God of heaven because he didn't worship him. I mean, that's what we do, isn't it? When we don't know what to do about something, we trust that the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be honored, Romans 8, 26. We trust that we can bow our heads and the all-powerful God of heaven can do something. Well, he couldn't do that. So he sought to use sorcery by hiring a sorcerer. I had trouble getting that first few times through Numbers 22 through 24 years ago when I first read it. Until you start reading some of the other passages that comment in the Bible on those passages, you really might not realize that Balaam was a wicked character. He went and he wanted 
desperately to curse Moab and get the wages of unrighteousness. 2 Peter 2 verse 15. But God wouldn't let him. On his way to go there, God made the donkey talk to put Balaam in his tracks. And it's interesting, it's always been interesting to me that he doesn't seem to see anything, you know, unusual about that. He just talks back to the donkey. And then God stops Balaam from talking when Balaam wants to. Essentially, the message is, I'd like to curse Israel. God won't let me. So instead, you know what he did, don't you? Revelation chapter 2, verse 14 puts it in plain language as Jesus spoke to the church at Pergamos. He said that Balaam taught Balak to put a stumbling block in the way of the children of Israel to sacrifice to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Well, Numbers chapter 25 records the incident. In Numbers, there's not a direct reference to Balaam there, but you put all these Bible pieces together and you have it. Balaam, essentially, at some point, I envision, took Balak aside and said, look, I can't really speak against these people, but if you want to get them, just entice them with sex. Just get those Midianite women, get those Moabite women going with them, and you get them involved like that, and you'll get them involved in the worship of your God, and then you'll have them. And you remember then that that happened, and they had to kill some people, and the Lord killed some people, about 24,000 that day, Book of Numbers says. And one fellow, while people were mourning and weeping in front of the tabernacle, took one of these Midianite women and paraded him in front of everybody as if to show off. And the plague wasn't stopped until good old Phineas went with a spear and thrust the both of them through to their deaths. God's serious about idolatry, wouldn't you say? And God is serious about people mocking him. God is serious about people mocking his people. Well, it got worse with Moab. Up in 2 Kings chapter 3, there was Misha, the king of Moab, who rather arrogantly on the Moabite stone called himself the son of Chemosh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and that's a real big if in my history. The son of Chemosh, who was the Moabite god, the abomination of the people of Moab, says 1 Kings 11 verse 7. Well, Misha wanted some satisfaction against Israel. He wasn't getting it. The battle was not going his way. Some intervention from God was taking place. He first took 700 of his men and went and did something outlandish in verse 26. And then in verse 27, as a last resort, here's what he did. He said, son, come here to his eldest son. And he sacrificed his eldest son to his God in a desperate attempt to gain some sort of victory when any god he was worshiping, any god whom he would satisfy with this sacrifice, did not exist in the first place. These are the consequences of idolatry and pride. Solomon, nevertheless, pulled away by his 700 wives and 300 concubines, built, built an idol. To worship Chemosh. 1 Kings 11 verse 7. And for their idolatry. The people of Chemosh would be punished. Throughout scripture. Isaiah 16 verse 6 says. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud. Of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. Don't you love that verse? He's proud of his pride. He's proud of his haughtiness. He's proud of his wrath. But these are all lies, and they won't come to fruition. Then we have the people of Ammon, who are mentioned, the descendants of Moab's twin brother, Ben-Ami. They plagued the people of Israel in Judges chapter 3 when Ehud the judge, I'm sorry, Othniel the judge, ah, Ehud the judge, stabbed Eglon, the king of Moab, with that knife that went all the way in and was sucked up by his fat belly. They plagued the people of Israel again in Judges chapter 10 and 11 with the infamous Jephthah. They plagued the people of Saul's day. Nahash the Ammonite in 1 Samuel chapter 11 wanted to make a peace treaty with the people of Jabesh Gilead and he said here's the conditions I get to put out all your right eyes. The moment became a defining time in Saul's ascension to the throne of Israel as he saved that town. David then had to deal with Nahon the Ammonite. When David sent overtures to him to try to be friendly, Hanun sent the people back with their beards half shaved and their garments cut off about their waist so that they had to walk back in shame. 
And then Solomon, the next king of Israel, pulled away by his foreign wives, built an idol to the same God of the people of Ammon. This God we take to be Molech, who was the infamous God to whom the children of Israel ended up offering their children in fire. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia article on Molech tells us that this God in his image would take the shape of a human being with a bull's head with outstretched arms to receive the sacrifice. Somehow there would be fire involved and the mothers of the babies who would be sacrificed would be standing at a little bit of a distance showing no emotion as if to not try to anger the gods or upset the people that their babies were about to be consumed by the fire. The music would get loud so that people could not hear the baby's cries. And then they would offer their children and pass them through the fire. People of Ammon would be judged several times as well. And then verses 13 and 14 of Zephaniah chapter 2 tell us about the king of Assyria. And he will stretch out his hand against the north, destroy Assyria, and make Nineveh a desolation, as dry as the wilderness. The herd shall lie down in her midst. Every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the bittern, shall lodge on the capital of her pillars. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at the threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar work. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt securely, that said in her heart, I am it, and there is none besides me. How has she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down? Everyone who passes by her shall hiss and shake his fist. God doesn't tolerate that against his people, but he says, I will make Assyria the kind of place that people will go by and they'll hiss and they'll shake their fist. Why? Because they were so proud. They said, I am it and there is none besides me. You know of a couple of instances of Assyria's pride as recorded in the book of First or Second Kings, chapters 18 and 19, as recorded in Isaiah 36 through 38, and also recorded in the Chronicles, when the king of Assyria brought his people against Jerusalem and Hezekiah was king. He said to them arrogantly, how are you going to beat me? I've beaten all these other cities. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad and Sepharvaim and Ina? All these cities that I've beaten, where are their gods? Their gods didn't save them. Now surely your God's not going to save you. Well, our God didn't put up with that. And when the king of Assyria and his men went to bed, when they woke up, most of them didn't. 185,000 were dead. And here, they'll be punished as well. Now that's a brief introduction to our background. Let's see how it applies. The cause of idolatry is at its core pride. Our loving God, this is one point that I've tried over the years to emphasize with teenagers. Our loving God asks nothing of us that is harmful for us, nor does he keep, for, from, keep us from anything that is helpful. We do not have an arbitrary God who sits in heaven and looks at the fun that people are having and says, I need to put a stop to that. The love of God is that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. We need to realize that and realize that the way of man is not in himself, but it is not in man who walks to direct his steps, Jeremiah 10, verse 23. In my teenage class the other day, I must brag on them, about eight out of the ten of them there were able to quote the memory verse that I assigned to them before I came back. Now let's see if I can quote it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Proverbs 3 verses 5 through 8. Obey that and you have no problem with idolatry. But if you don't obey that, idolatry may not grab you at the first, but it'll get you somewhere down the line. Because you're leaving the one God and essentially lifting up yourself. The Gentiles of Romans chapter 1 had no excuse. But they degraded into the most lewd and sordid sorts of behavior because they worshipped and served the creature 
rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. They degraded, and they degraded badly. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Here's the truth. God is on his throne. We're his. There is a God, and I'm not him, as someone says. And people just suppress that truth. Why? They don't want to behave. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as, listen to this, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. It wasn't as if these people didn't know. They just didn't like it that there was a God who wasn't them. They didn't want to serve him. They didn't want to behave that way. Do you know that Aldous Huxley, the grandson of Thomas Huxley, who was Charles Darwin's bulldog in getting evolution enforced as policy in Britain. Aldous Huxley wrote, well, I have the quote back here somewhere, but I won't find it because I don't have time. Uh, Aldous Huxley wrote that the chief thing he wanted to do in getting rid of God was to free himself up sexually. God was interfering with my sexual freedom. I wanted him out. And I was so glad I found evolution. That's what pride does. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, all right, all right, here's what you do then, folks. You get rid of God. If you don't like to retain God in your knowledge, of course, I'm speaking sarcastically. It's in the Bible. People did that. You want to you get rid of these behavioral restraints that you don't like? You want to be like the guys on the sitcoms? You want to be like everybody that just has fun and do what they Here's what you do. Don't believe in God. Just believe in yourself. And then they tell us, just atheism. Atheism, that's the way to go. There is no God. Or agnosticism that you don't know. But atheism, that there is no God. But all atheism does is enthrones another God, the God of chance and the God of self. Well, I think the world came about because of an endless series of chance accidents that took place over billions of years. You know, there's no blind faith involved in that. All the reasonable evidence points to God. All the disbelief, all the irrepressible pride, all the misbehavior of man points to some other God. You won't stay in an atheistic, secularistic condition. If Romans 1 teaches anything, that's it. You will degrade to worship something else. That's where our country is. That's where we are as people. We are not anymore worried about atheism. Do you know that people in Belleville, West Virginia, if you need a map, don't look on your GPS, it ain't there. If you need a, if Belleville, West Virginia, have idols to Buddha on their mantle. It's home. Idolatry is here. These kids have been raised believing evolution, believing everything was okay. They don't know their Bible stories, as I think Adam mentioned earlier. They don't know anybody loves them. They love to come to church, but their single father married with the single mother of three other kids that hang around sometime won't let them. And they want to worship something, because that's the nature of man. Every culture wants to worship someone, wants to worship something, so they look for something, and they turn on Oprah. Or they turn on these sitcoms that deal with karma and dharma and everything else, Buddhistic and Hinduistic. We've got to do something about it. I've done left the script a long time ago. I'm sorry for that. When someone brings you material for church Bible classes, and it's dealing with things that you think are far away and very far removed. Please take a second look. 
No longer can we only deal with how to be different from denominationalism. We need that. Please don't misunderstand me. But our job seems to be now, we've got to convince people that Christ is the only way to salvation in the first place. We've got to convince these young people, we've got to tell them about Hinduism before they get to college and learn about it without the influence of their parents around. People are objecting. Well, we don't, you know, I've heard of people objecting. Well, we don't need that. We don't have uh, Hindus, Buddhists around here. Yes, we do. And if we don't, we pump it in on the satellite or through the cable. We've got to teach. We've got to save these children. And the adults, too. But the children who grow up wanting to know God. But nobody took the time to introduce them. Moab's immorality is seen in our culture today. A preacher several years ago suggested to me that we don't worship temples. We don't worship gods the way they used to worship gods. They used to go to the temple of Aphrodite or Venus or Artemis or whoever, and they would pay their dues, and they would offer a sacrifice, and then they'd engage in ceremonial prostitution. We just skip the middleman and engage in the prostitution. Our culture is obsessed with sexuality. Some people might get upset that I say the word a little bit too much in sermons. I try to tend to tone it down a little bit when there's more children in the audience. But listen, we've got to preach plainly about it because that's what our world's religion is right now. We've got to tell them God's side of things and speak a little bit more openly about it. That was Moab's problem. I, I can't curse these people, but you can get them to love their people of the other sex or people of the same sex. They'll love their feelings so much that when you tell them there's a God and they're wrong, they won't want any part to do with it because the darkness does not come to the light lest its deeds should be exposed. John 3, verse 20. And then Ammon's sin, giving the babies up. You know where I'm going with that. And it's not abortion, it's infanticide. 20 years ago when I started preaching against abortion, I warned about infanticide. And now Peter Singer's up at Princeton University saying, talking about replaceable infants. Mother has, he says, two infants, second one has hemophilia. It'd be better for her to kill the second one and try again for a third. You ought to have up to a year he said, to decide whether to let your baby live, see if its health problems are going to work themselves out. He is teaching the young minds that will make policy in 20 years and be elected in 20 years. And guess what, folks? You get a system where somebody is deciding health care for you and you got some atheistic bureaucrat deciding how to divvy up the resources and you got a Down syndrome baby, you're going to be last on the list. I'm not a prophet. So I'm not giving you specifics. I'm pleading that we pray to save ourselves from the consequences of idolatry, of worshiping ourselves, of thinking that we're so important. One of the great sins of Israel was that they were syncretistic. That's S-Y-N-C-R-E something or other. <laughs> they said one God was as good as another. Yes, we'll worship you, God, but in your temple, we'll put a picture of Baal, we'll put a picture of Asher, and we'll, you know, Ezekiel crawled through the wall, and he saw all that was going on there, and he wept. And there were people in the temple having an idolatrous service, weeping for Tammuz. Every, every God's as good as another. I have an American sense of fair play and freedom of religion. But then there's something in the Bible that's been teaching people for a lot of years that there's still only one God. So if you want to construct a system that says, okay, you can't have a Bible club in that school because you might also have a Koran club in that school, now, you think through this, and you correct me later if you want. Yeah, that seems all fair and nice, or if you have a Bible club, you also have a Koran club. That seems all good and nice, except for this. God is God, and all is not. The Bible is his word, and the Koran is not. And if you want a society where you're not being persecuted for every move that you make, you give honor to God because he's jealous of these imposters. The pride 
of idolatry brings individuals and nations down. Pray for leaders. Pray for your children to get the best education they can be and be the ethicists that write the scholarly papers that challenge Peter Singer. Pray for your children to grow up and be the kinds of preachers of the gospel who call people's attention to these sorts of things. Pray for your children to grow and get the kind of education they need to challenge everybody and everything, to be the lawyers, yes, the Christian lawyers, who don't know any fear in going to the judges of the land. And pray for the politicians that will appoint some judges in the land that have some sense. Amen. And that honor God... Because honoring God is the only way they will have some sense. Alexander Campbell once said, I can't document it, but I read it. And if he didn't say it, it's, he ought to, because it's true. <laughs> Don't expect the errorists, people who are in error, to make sense. If they made sense, they wouldn't be in error. Don't expect people with an allegiance to a foreign God to have anything to do with the standard of ethics and morality that is in the Bible. And let me suggest to you that the standard of ethics and morality that is in the Bible is the only standard of ethics and morality you want to raise a child in. You don't want to raise him in a Muslim society. Yes, son, you grow up to be 19, you can blow yourself up and go to be with 70 virgins. You don't want to raise him in a Hindu society. If your life's not going too well, kill yourself. Maybe you'll come back as something better. Yeah, these are the logical consequences. Idolatry brings us down, and our nation is there. It's no longer waiting, it's there. And thank God. God, that we're a little bit sheltered here in the backwoods of West Virginia. That's why I live here, you know. But it's right on our doorstep, too. And if and if it weren't, we owe it to people where it is on their doorstep and in their homes to preach the gospel to them. Right before those long verses about the Gentiles' degradation from a knowledge of God to a de-knowledge of God to the sinfulness and the homosexuality and the murder that they committed, came this passage. You can get your songbooks ready now. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God was going to bring in people who were from the Jewish religion, the predecessor to Christianity, but he was also going to bring in all those Gentiles who worshipped all those other gods into the glorious, saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, God forbid that America would fall and persecution should come. But if it does, you can be a part of the kingdom that was represented by a stone cut out of a mountain without hands that breaks in pieces and crushes all other kingdoms. You do it by being born again of the water and the spirit. You're washed in the blood of the Lamb. You're raised to walk in newness of life. You've chosen the kingdom of God. And in the last day when Jesus comes to put an end to all rule and all authority and all power, and when he is known and recognized as King of kings and Lord of lords, then you will be elevated on his arms, figuratively speaking, to be presented to the Father. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. If you've been faithful in that, if you love him, if you serve him and you allow no idol to come between you and you keep a check on your pride because that's the first step. If we could help you, would you come as we stand and sing?